Hi, hello there. It's me again. And uh, we are getting pretty, pretty close to the end by now. Probably won't finish it today. Um, but we are we're just about getting there. Uh, we're going to be continuing to read out of Journey to the Center of the Earth uh, by Jules Verne. Chapter 37, The Little Brock Museum of Geology. It would be impossible to describe the emotions which, in turn, shook the breast of Dr. Lindenbrock. First amazement, then incredulity, lastly an outburst of rage. Never had I seen a man so put out and then so exasperated. The fatigues of our crossing, the dangers we had faced, had all to be repeated. We had gone backwards instead of forwards. But my uncle rapidly recovered himself. Well then, is fate playing tricks on me? Are the elements plotting against me? Will fire, air, and water make a combined attack against me? Well, I shall know what a determined man can do. I shall not yield. I will not take a single step backwards. And we'll see whether man or nature is to have the upper hand. Standing a wreck on the rock, angry and threatening, Otto Lindenbrock looked like a rather grotesque parody of the fierce Ajax defying the gods. But I thought it my duty to step in and attempt to restrain this crazy fanaticism. Just listen to me, I said firmly. There has to be some limit to this ambition of yours. We can't do the impossible. We're in no state to set out on another sea voyage. Who would dream of undertaking a voyage of 500 leagues on a heap of rotten planks with a ragged blanket for a sail, a stick for a mast, and fierce winds in our teeth? We can't steer. We'll be blown about by the storms, and we would be fools and madmen for attempting to cross a second time. I was able to develop this series of irrefutable reasons for ten whole minutes without interruption. It wasn't, however, that the professor was paying any respectful attention to his nephew's arguments, but because he was deaf to all my eloquence. To the raft, he shouted. This was his only reply. There was no point in me entreating, pleading, getting angry, or doing anything else by way of opposing him. I would only have been opposing a will harder than the granite rock. Hans was finishing the repairs to the raft. It was as if this strange being was able to guess my uncle's plans. With a few more pieces of Sutobrander, we had repaired our ship. A sail was already hanging at the new mast, and the wind was playing in its waving folds. The professor said a few words to the guide, and immediately he put everything on board and arranged everything necessary for our departure. The air was clear, and the northwest wind was blowing steadily. What could I do? Could I make a stand against the two of them? Impossible. If only Hans had taken my side. But no, it was not to be. The Icelander seemed to have renounced all will of his own, and made a vow to forget and deny himself. I could get nothing out of a servant so futilely subservient, as it were, to his master. My only course was to proceed. I was therefore going to take my usual place on the raft when my uncle put his hand on my shoulder. We'll not set sail until tomorrow, he said, and made a gesture of total resignation. I mustn't neglect anything, he said. And since fate has driven me on to this part of the coast, I won't leave until I've examined it. To understand this comment, it must be borne in mind that, although we had returned to the northern shore of the sea, we were not at the spot we had set out from. Port Robin had to be to the west of us. It therefore made perfect sense to carefully investigate the area around our new landing place. Now, let's go and see what we can find, I said. And leaving Hans to his work, we set off together. There was some considerable distance between the water and the foot of the cliffs. It took us half an hour to reach the wall of rock. We trampled under our feet countless seashells of all the forms and sizes that existed in the earliest ages of the world. I also saw immense animal shells, more than 15 feet in diameter. They had been the coverings of those gigantic glyptodons, or armadillos of the Pliocene epoch, of which the modern tortoise is but a miniature representative. In addition, the soil was scattered with stony fragments, shingle rounded by the action of water, and formed in successive rows. I was therefore led to the conclusion that, at one time, the sea must have, been covered, uh, must have covered the ground on which we were treading. On the loose and scattered rocks, now beyond the reach of the highest tides, the waves had left clear traces of their passage. This might, to a certain extent, explain the existence of an ocean forty leagues beneath the surface of the globe. But 
By my theory, this mass of liquid must be gradually disappearing into the bowels of the earth, and it clearly originated in the waters of the ocean above, which had made their way here through some fissure. Yet it must be assumed that the fissure was now closed, and that this whole cavern, or rather this immense reservoir, had filled in a very short time. Perhaps this water, subjected to the fierce action of subterranean heat, had been partially converted into vapor. This would explain the existence of those clouds hanging over our heads, and the development of the electricity which raids such tempests within the body of the globe. This theory regarding the phenomena we had witnessed seemed satisfactory to me, for no matter how great and stupendous are the phenomena of nature, established physical laws can always explain them. We were therefore walking on sedimentary soil, the deposits of the waters of former ages. The professor was carefully examining every little fissure in the rocks. Wherever he saw a hole, he always wanted to know how deep it was. To him, this was important. We had been following the coast of the Lindenbrock Sea for a mile, when we noticed a sudden change in the appearance of the soil. It seemed to have been turned upside down, contorted and convulsed by a violent upheaval of the lower strata. In many places, depressions or elevations bore witness to some tremendous power causing the dislocation of strata. We moved with difficulty across these granite fragments, mingled with flint, quartz, and alluvial deposits, when a field, no, more than a field, a vast plain of bleached bones lay spread out before us. It looked like a huge cemetery, where the remains of twenty ages mingled their dust together. Immense mounds of bony fragments rose up in the distance. They stretched out in waves as far as the horizon, and then were lost in a faint haze. Within three square miles, there were accumulated the materials for a complete history of the animal life through the ages, a history scarcely sketched out in the all-too-recent strata of the inhabited world. But impatient curiosity carried us forward. Crackling and rattling, our feet were trampling on the remains of prehistoric animals and interesting fossils, the possession of which is a matter of rivalry and contention between the museums of great cities. A thousand cuviers could never have re reconstructed the organic remains deposited in this magnificent and unparalleled collection. I stood there in amazement. My uncle had raised his long arms toward the vault which was our sky, his mouth gaping wide, his eyes flashing beneath his shining spectacles, his head nodding and shaking. His whole stance denoted utter astonishment. There he stood, looking at an immense collection of scattered Lepthoptera, Miracothera, Lepiothera, Analoptheria, Megatheria, Protopytheritae, Pterodactyls, Mastodons, and all sorts of extinct monsters gathered here together for his private satisfaction. Imagine an enthusiastic bibliophile suddenly dropped into the middle of the famous Alexandrian library that was burnt by Omar and by some miracle restored from its ashes. That was my uncle, Professor Lindenbrock. But more was to come when, rushing through the clouds of bone dust, he put his hand on a bare skull and exclaimed with a voice trembling with excitement, Axel! Axel! A human skull! A human skull! I cried, no less astonished. Yes, my boy. Oh, Millie Edwards! Oh, de Quatrefage! How I wish you were standing here with me, Otto Lindenbrock! Chapter 38 the professor in his chair again. To understand this last exclamation of my uncle's, addressed to two famous French scientists, you have to know about an event of great importance from a paleontological point of view, which had occurred shortly before our departure. On the 28th of March, 1863, some excavators working under the direction of uh, Mr. Boucher de Paris in the stone quarries of moulin Quignon near Abbeville in the Department of the Somme, found a human jawbone 14 feet beneath the surface of the ground. It was the first fossil of this sort that had ever been brought to light. Not far from it were found some stone hatches and flint tools, stained with a uniform platina by the passage of time. The impact of this discovery was immense, not just in France, but also in England and Germany. Several scientists at the French Institute, 
among whom were Messieurs Milling Edwards and de Catrafage, at once saw the importance of this discovery, proved the geniusness of the bone in question, and became the most ardent defendants in, which, in what the English called the jawbone trial. Geologists of the United Kingdom, uh, Messieurs Falconer, Brusque, Carpenter, and others, who believed the fact is certain, were soon joined by German scholars, the most eminent, the most ardent, and the most enthusiastical of whom was my uncle Lindbrock. The genuineness of a human fossil relic of the Quaternary period seemed, therefore, to be incontestably proved and accepted. It is true that this theory met with a most obstinate opponent in Mr. Elie de Beaumont. This eminent authority maintained that the soil of moulin Quignon was not from the Duluvial period at all, but was of much more recent formation, and, agreeing in that with Cuvier, he refused to admit that the human species could be contemporary with the animals of the Quaternary period. My uncle Lindbrock, along with the great majority of geologists, had held his ground, he disputed and argued, until Monsieur Elie de Montbeaumont stood alone in his opposition. We knew all of these details of the affair, but we were not aware that since our departure, the matter had developed further. Other similar jawbones, although belonging to individuals of various types in different nations, were found in the loose gray soil of certain grottoes in France, Switzerland, and Belgium, as well as weapons, tools, earthenware utensils, bones of children and adults. So the existence of man in the quaternary period seemed to have become ever more certain as the day passed. But that was not all. Fresh discoveries of remains in the Pliocene formation had emboldened other geologists to attribute the human species to an even earlier period. It is true that these remains were not human bones, but objects bearing the traces of human handiwork, such as fossil leg bones of animals evidently sculpted and carved by the hand of man. Thus, in one bound, man had risen several rungs further back up the ladder of time. He was a predecessor of the Mastodon. He was a contemporary of the Southern Elephant. He lived a hundred thousand years ago, when, according to geologists, the Pliocene was being formed. Such, then, was the state of paleontological science, and what we knew of it was sufficient to explain our behavior in the presence of this stupendous Golgotha. Anyone can now understand my uncle's frenzied excitement when, twenty yards further on, he found himself face to face with a primitive man. It was a perfectly recognizable human body, had some peculiarity of the soil, like that of St. Michel's Cemetery at Bordeaux, preserved in it this condition for such a long time. It might be so, but this dried corpse, with its parchment-like skin drawn tightly over the bony frame, the limbs still preserving their shape, sound teeth, abundant hair, and finger and toenails of a frightening length, this desiccated mummy startled us by appearing just as it had lived countless ages ago. I stood mute before this apparition of remote antiquity. My uncle, usually so garrulous, was likewise struck dumb. We lifted the body. We stood it up against the rocks. It seemed to stare at us out of its empty socket. We sounded his hollow frame. After some moment's silence, the uncle gave way to the professor again. Otto Lindbrock, reverting to his character, forgot all of the circumstances of our eventful journey, forgot where we were standing, forgot the vaulted cavern which held us. No doubt in his mind, he was back again at the Yehanium, lecturing to his pupils, for he adopted a professorial tone, and, addressing himself to an imaginary audience, spoke as follows. Gentlemen, I have the honor to introduce you to a man of the quaternary system. Eminent geologists have denied his existence, Others, no less eminent, have affirmed it. The doubting Thomases of paleontology, if they were here, might now touch them with their fingers, and would be obliged to acknowledge their error. I am quite aware that science has to be on its guard with discoveries of this kind. I know what capital enterprising individuals like Barnum have made out of fossil men. I have heard the tale of Ajax's kneecap, of the supposed body of Orestes, claimed to have been found by the Spartans, and of the body of Asterius, ten cubits long, that Posenius speaks of. I have read the reports of the skeleton of Trapani, found in the 14th century, and which was at the time identified as that of Polyphemus. 
and the history of the giant, unearthed in the 16th century near Palermo. You know as well as I do, gentlemen, the analysis made at Lucerne in 1577 of those huge bones, which the celebrated Dr. Felix Platter affirmed to be those of a giant 19 feet high. I have gone through the treatises of Cassanian, and all those memoirs, pamphlets, assertions, and rejoinders published respecting the skeleton of Tetubocus, the invader of Gaul, dug out of a sandpit of the Dauphine in 1613. In the 18th century, I would have stood up for Schertzer's pre-Adamite man against Peter Caput. I have held in my hands the pamphlet entitled Giga Here. My uncle encountered his unfortunate affliction, that of being unable to pronounce difficult words in public. The pamphlet entitled Gigan... He could get no further. Gigantio... It was no good. The unfortunate word would not come out. At the Hanium, there would have been laughter. Gigantus theology, at last the professor burst out, between two words which I shall not record here. Then, rushing on with renewed vigor and great animation, Yes, gentlemen, I know all these things and more. I know that Cuvier and Blumenbach have recognized in those bones nothing more remarkable than the bones of the mammoth and other mammals of the Quaternary period. But... In the presence of this specimen, to doubt would be to insult science. There stands the body. You may see it, touch it. It is not a mere skeleton. It is an entire body, preserved for a purely anthropological purpose. I was wise enough not to contradict this startling assertion. If I could only wash it in a solution of sulfuric acid, my uncle continued, I would be able to rid it of all the particles of earth and the shells with which it is encrusted. But I do not have that valuable solvent here with me. Yet, such as it is, the body will tell us its own wonderful story. Here, the professor took hold of the fossil skeleton and handled it with the skill and dexterity of a showman. You see, he said, that it is not six feet tall and that we are still a long way away from the supposed race of giants. As for the family to which it belongs, it is evidently Caucasian. It is of the white race, our own. The skull of this fossil is a regular oval, or rather ovoid. It inhibits no prominent cheekbones, no protecting jaws. It presents no appearance of that prognathism which reduces the facial angle. Measure that angle. It is nearly 90 degrees. But I will go no further in my deductions, and I will affirm that this specimen of the human family is of the Japhetic race, which has since spread from the Indies to the Atlantic. Do not smile, gentlemen. Nobody was smiling, but the learned professor was frequently disturbed by the broad smiles provoked in by his learned eccentrics. Yes, he pursued with animation. This is a fossil man, the contemporary of the mastodons whose remains fill this amphitheater. But if you ask me how he came to be here, how those strata on which he was lying slipped down into this enormous hollow in the globe, I confess I cannot answer that question. No doubt in the quaternary period, considerable movement was still disturbing the crust of the earth. The long-continued cooling of the globe gave rise to chasms, fissures, clefts, and fault, into which, very probably, portions of the upper earth may have fallen. Make no rash assertions. But there is the man surrounded by his own works, by hatchets, by carved flints, which were characteristics of the Stone Age. And unless he came here, like myself, as a tourist on a visit, and as a pioneer of science, I can entertain no doubt of the authenticity of his remote origin. The professor stopped speaking, and his audience broke out into loud and unanimous applause. For, of course, my uncle was right, and wiser men than his nephew would have found it hard to refute his statements. Another remarkable thing. This fossil body was not the only one in this immense catacomb. We came across other bodies at every step amongst the dust, and my uncle could have selected any of the most curious of these specimens to demolish the incredulity of skeptics. In fact, it was an amazing sight. These generations of men and animals mingling in their common cemetery, when one very serious question came to our minds which we scarcely dared consider. Had all those creatures slid through a great fissure in the crust of the earth? down to the shores of the Lidenbrock Sea, where they were dead and turning to dust, 
Or had they lived and grown and died here in this subterranean world under a false sky, just like inhabitants of uh, the upper earth? Until the present time, the only creatures we had seen alive were sea monsters and fish. Might not some living being, some native of the abyss, still be found on those desolate shores? Chapter 39. Forest Scenery Illuminated by Electricity For another half hour, we walked over a carpet of bones. We pushed on, driven by our burning curiosity. What other marvels did this cavern contain? What new treasures lay here for science to unfold? I was prepared for any surprise. My imagination was ready for any eventuality, no matter how astounding. We had long since lost sight of the seashore behind the hills of bones. The foolhardy professor, unconcerned about losing his way, dragged me on and on. We walked in silence, bathed in the luminous waves of electricity. By some phenomenon, which I am unable to explain, it lit up all sides of every object to an equal extent. It was so diffuse, there being no central point from which the light emanated, that shadows no longer existed. You might have thought yourself under the rays of a vertical sun in a tropical region at midday in the height of summer. No vapor was visible. The rocks, the distant mountains, a few isolated clumps of forest trees in the distance, presented a weird and wonderful aspect under these totally new conditions of universal diffusion of light. We were like Hoffman's shadowless man. A mile further on, we reached the edge of a vast forest, not one of those forests of fungi which bordered Port Graubin. Here, the vegetation was of the tertiary period, in the fullest extent of its magnificence. Tall palm trees belonged to species no longer living, other splendid palm-like trees, firs, yews, cypresses, thuyas, representatives of the conifers, were linked together by a tangled network of creepers. A soft carpet of mosses and liverworts clothed the soil luxuriously. A few sparkling streams ran almost in silence under what have been the shade of the trees, except that there was no shadow. On their banks grew tree ferns similar to those we grow in hothouses, but a remarkable feature was the total absence of color in all of those trees, shrubs, and plants, growing without the life-giving heat and the light of the sun. They all merged together in a uniform brownish color like that of fading and faded leaves. Not a green leaf anywhere, and the flowers, which were abundant enough in the tertiary period, which first gave birth to flowers, looked like brown paper cutouts, with neither color nor scent. Uncle Lindenbrock ventured into this colossal grove. I followed him, not without some apprehension. Since nature had provided plant nourishment here, why shouldn't there be fierce animals there, too? In the broad clearings, left by fallen trees, decayed with age, I could see leguminous plants, a serenae, rubicae, and many other edible shrubs dear to ruminant animals of every period. Then I observed, mingling together in confusion, trees of countries far separated on the surface of the globe. The oak and the palm were growing side by side. The Australian eucalyptus leaned against the Norwegian pine. The birch tree of the north mingled its foliage with New Zealand cowries. It was enough to drive the most ingenious classifier of terrestrial botany to distraction. Suddenly I stopped. I held my uncle back. The diffused light made it easy to make out even the smallest of objects in the dense thickets. I thought I could see, no, I did see, with my own eyes, enormous forms moving among the trees. They were gigantic animals, a herd of mastodons, not fossil remains, but alive, resembling the ones whose bones were found in the marshes of Ohio in 1801. I could see those huge elephants under the trees with their trunks writhing like a host of serpents. I could hear the crashing noise of their long ivory tusks, boring into the old decaying trunks. Branches were cracking, and the leaves that were torn away in cartloads were going down the monster's cavernous throats. So then, the dream in which I had a vision of the prehistoric world of the tertiary and quaternary periods had become a reality, and there we were alone in the bowels of the earth, at the mercy of its wild inhabitants. My uncle was gazing at the scene with intense and eager interest. Come on, said he, seizing my arm. Let's take a closer look. No, I won't, I cried. We don't have any guns. What could we do in the middle of a herd of these four-footed giants? 
Come on, Uncle, let's just get away. No human being could safely risk upsetting these monstrous beasts. No human creature, replied my uncle in a lower voice. You're wrong, Axel. Look down here. I fancy I see a living creature similar to ourselves. It's a man. I looked, shaking my head incredulously. But though at first I couldn't believe it, I had to yield to the evidence of my senses. In fact, about a quarter of a mile away, leaning against the trunk of a gigantic kauri, stood a human being, the Proteus of those subterranean regions, as new son of Neptune, watching this countless herd of mastodons. Eminus pectoris cusos imenor ipse. Imenor ipse? Yes, truly more gigantic. We were no longer dealing with a fossil being like the man, whose dried remains we had easily lifted up in the field of bones. This fellow was a giant, well able to control those monsters. In stature, he was at least twelve feet tall. His head, as big as a buffalo's, was half hidden in the thick, tangled growth of his unkempt hair. It most resembled the mane of the primitive elephant. In his hand, he held an enormous branch, a crook worthy of this antediluvian shepherd. We stood there, petrified and speechless with amazement. But what if he saw us? We had to get away. Come on, uncle, run for it, I said, dragging my uncle away. For once, he allowed himself to be persuaded. In a quarter of an hour, our feet had carried us beyond the reach of this terrifying monster. And yet, now that I can consider the matter quietly, now that I am calm again, now that months have slipped by since this strange and supernatural meeting, what am I to think? What am I to believe? I have to conclude that the whole thing was impossible, that our senses were deceived, that our eyes didn't see what we thought they saw. No human beings live in this subterranean world. No human race lives in those deep caverns of the globe, unknown and unconnected with the inhabitants of its surface. It would be crazy to think they did. I prefer to think that it might have been some animal whose structure resembled that of humans, some ape or baboon of the early geological ages, some protopithius or mesopithius, like the one discovered by Lorray in the deposit of bones in Zansom. But this creature was far larger than any known to modern paleontology. No matter, it had to be an ape. Yes, definitely, an ape, improbable as that might be. That a human being, a living person, and therefore, no doubt, a whole race of humans beside him, should be entombed there in the bowels of the earth, was impossible. Meanwhile, we had left the clear, brightly lit forest, speechless with astonishment, overwhelmed with a stupefaction which reduced us almost to the level of dumb animals. We kept on running for fear that the horrible monster might be on our trail. We really were fleeing. It was just like the feeling of being driven along in spite of oneself that one often experiences in nightmares. Instinctively, we made our way back to the Lindenbrock Sea, and I cannot say into what wandering thoughts my mind might have carried me, but for a circumstance which brought me back to practical matters. Although I was certain that we were now walking on the ground, never before trodden by our feet, I often noticed groups of rock which reminded me of those around Port Groby. Besides, this seemed to confirm the indications of the compass needle, and to show that we had unintentionally returned to the north shore of the Lindenbrock Sea. Occasionally I felt quite sure about it. Brooks and waterfalls were tumbling everywhere from projections in the rocks. I thought I recognized the bed of Suterbrandur, our faithful Hans's brook, and the grotto in which I had regained life and consciousness. Then, a few paces farther on, the arrangement of the cliffs, cliffs, the appearance of an unrecognized stream, or the strange outline of a rock, threw me into doubt again. I expressed my doubts to my uncle. Like me, he wasn't sure. He didn't recognize anything in this unvarying landscape. It seems clear, I said, that we haven't landed our original starting point, but the storm has carried us a little further up, and if we follow the shore, we'll find Port Grobin. If that's the case, it'll be useless to continue our exploration, and we'd much better return to our raft. But, Axel, could you be mistaken? It's difficult to be sure, Uncle, because all these rocks are so very much alike, but I think I recognize the promontory where Hans built our boat. We must be very near the little port, if it is indeed not it. I added, examining a creek which I thought I recognized. 
No, Axel. We would at least find our own tracks, and I can't see anything. But I can see something, I exclaimed, darting towards an object lying on the sand. And I showed my uncle a rusty dagger, which I had just picked up. Come now, he said. Were you carrying this weapon with you? Me? Most, no, most certainly not. But were you perhaps... Not as far as I know, said the professor. I'm not aware of ever having had this object in my possession. Well, this is strange. No, Axel, it's very simple. Icelanders often carry weapons of this sort. This must belong to Hans, and he's lost it. I shook my head. Hans had never had an object like this on him either. Might it not have belonged to some pre warrior, I exclaimed, to some living man contemporary with the gigantic herdsman. But no, it can't be. This is not a relic of the Stone Age. It's not even from the Bronze Age. This blade is made of steel. My uncle stopped me abruptly on this path that my new train of thought was leading down, and said in a cold voice, Calm down, Axel, and see sense. This dagger dates from the 16th century. It's a poniard such as gentlemen carried in their belts to give the coup de grace. It's of Spanish origin. It was never yours or mine or the hunter's, nor did it belong to any of those human beings who may or may not inhabit this inner world. Look, it was never made jagged like this by cutting men's throats. Its blade is coated in a rust that is neither a day nor a year nor even a hundred years old. The professor was, as usual, getting excited and allowing his imagination to run away with him. Axel, we're on our way to a great discovery. This blade has been lying here on the shore for a hundred years, two hundred years, three hundred years, and has become chipped and notched on the rocks that surround this subterranean sea. But it hasn't got here on its own. It hasn't got bent like that on its own. Someone has been here before us. Yes, some man has. And who was that man? A man who engraved his name somewhere with that dagger. A man who wanted to mark once again the way to the center of the earth. Let's have a look around. And our interest was now well aroused. We searched all along the high wall, looking into every fissure which might open out into a gallery. And in this way we came to a place where the shore was much narrower. Here the sea lapped the foot of the steep cliff, leaving a passage no more than a couple of yards wide. Between two projecting rocks, appeared the mouth of a dark tunnel. There, on a granite slab, were two mysterious carved letters, half eaten away by time. They were initials of the bold and daring adventurer. A.S., shouted my uncle. Arne Segnusum! Arne Segnusum again! And that leads us directly to Chapter 40, Preparations for Blasting a Passage to the Center of the Earth. Um... But that'll be where we leave off for this time. Um, hope to see you again next time. Uh, thank you very much.